Lucy Ward, welcome to the Mapper Ford podcast. Thank you very much. It's super exciting for us to finally actually have a conversation and our first conversation happens to be on the podcast. I know, right? It's hilarious. <laughs> so you're a green buyer and we're in extremely strange times uh, in the world, but mm-hmm. we as a coffee industry uh, have lots to focus on right now and... Uh, You and I have been talking over DM on Instagram about what's going on and Ah. you've been buying coffee for a number of years now and I thought it would be great for us to have a discussion about some of the concerns that we need to make sure that we're focusing on and that we're paying attention to. So thanks for doing this. It it really does mean a lot. Uh, It's a pleasure, absolute pleasure to be here. What do you think um, are the things that are the biggest red flags right now for us in the industry? Look, COVID is going to change our industry, whether we like it or not. It has uh, had a huge impact and it's had the impact in both consuming side and producing side. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to be uh, really thinking about what's what's happening throughout the entire supply chain um, as consumers. Like, I mean, obviously I'm coming from the roaster side, I'm coming from the buyer side. I need to be considerate of what's going on both ends. Mm. 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 You obviously spend a lot of time talking with producers, being a green coffee buyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of time. <laughs> it's probably to producers, a, yeah. an important part of your job, I would suspect. Yeah, it's <laughs> tiny, 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 tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> what are you hearing? What are some of their concerns? Uh. I am hearing a lot of different things because mm-hmm. I'm in, I'm talking to a lot of different countries, and the impact has been really different all over the place. Let's dissect some of it. So I'm hearing some of the stuff from like, okay, so Brazil is obviously one that's been in the news quite a lot lately. Um, Obviously, I'm hearing that uh, things have slowed down quite a lot in terms of their production. So, you know, they're being impacted by COVID because of movement of uh, movement of workers. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of fear out there at the moment. Um, But their shipping lines are going okay. So we've got that, like, sort of imbalance of what's happening in shipping but also in production. Production is like, I mean, they're in harvest at the moment, right, in Brazil. Right. Um, And they're sitting at around about 20 24%, something like that, of their harvest has been done already. This time last year they were at around about 40% was done. Okay, so they're really slowing down. So let's let's break that down and just summarise what you've just said for people Mm. Um, so for Brazil specifically, there's logistical issues because mm-hmm. even though the ports are open, getting anything that is ready to ship is a logistical issue in country, not from getting it yeah. to the sea. From yeah, country yeah. To country. So it's worker movement right. and uh, the ability for workers to be out in the field and, you know, working next to each other and that sort of thing. So, you know, obviously, you know, close contact equals transmission. Right. So we need to try and avoid that. Um, in order to do that, you need to have less staff working. Having less staff working slows things down. So um, once it gets to the port, it's easy enough to get the coffee out. Lots of uh, because Brazil is a massive exporter, mm. right? And so they're kind of already prepared for this, yep. but they're not prepared in the field so well. Mm. So they're at twenty four percent. You said, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Does this mean that we're going to start to see? And please excuse my ignorance around any of this. I'm here to learn and, and ask the questions. So forgive no any of my ignorance. So from what we've learned so far, a big question that keeps popping up from people on the podcast and, and by people I mean producers is they don't know or they didn't know from a few months ago when we started talking about this whether the eventuality of this pandemic was going to mean that more specialty coffee was going to end up in commercial in a, in the commercial grade because people weren't able to have access to the workforces necessary to pay attention to the coffee mm. or the labor required to make coffee score the, pro, the the scores that specialty needed do you think that that's going to eventuate in brazil given that we have such a um, a slower rate of manual labour? 
I think it will and it won't. So I think what will be a bigger driving factor for comm- for sorry for specialty grade coffee to move into the commercial and be sold as commercial will actually be uh, the rejection of buyers like myself. Um, because we have had such a slowdown on purchasing that we a lot of a lot of buyers have halted purchasing completely, which then means that we've got all these specialty coffees that need to be sold in order to make money. So, so they're going to be forced on the commercial market. to put it in commercial purely to get a return yeah. on it. It may still exactly. be scoring an eighty-five or whatever, but exactly they can't move it in specialty, so they have to sell it so through. Commercial. They'll have to sell it at a discounted rate into the commercial. Um, you know, if you can't move your coffee, that's what you have to do with it. And that would, you know, obviously break their hearts to have to do that sort of thing. Um, but mm. I think the knee-jerk reaction from consuming countries with COVID has been to stop selling, sorry, stop buying completely um, because, well, you know, our sales dropped. I mean, I've, I've heard reports of some roasteries dropping down to like 20% of their original volume. Yeah. Um, and that's... Huge, huge. By the hit. end of this year, from all the business owners I've spoken to and I've kept a tally, uh, mm. it's somewhere in the order of eight out of ten business will will close by the end of this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's astronomical. Yeah, it's going to be. It, it, it's absolutely astronomical. You know, I think um, people are still consuming, especially coffee, and people are still consuming commercial grade coffee in the same volume they were before. More. But it's how they're drinking it. Yeah, even more. Um, I mean, uh, I was reading an article the other day that came out of the States that was saying that um, specialty grade coffee is being sold as like a small luxury that people can still afford in Mm. their homes. So they're purchasing these really high-end, beautiful beans and brewing them at home instead of going to the cafe. So it's not all like bad. It's just how is it being sold is completely different now. Right. And I think that... The, there's been a shift on the consumer end and on mm-hmm. the, the commerce end whereby people are – supermarkets are winning big at the moment. So we're hearing numbers over here. And for anyone who's tuning in for the first time, I'm in San Diego and Luce is in Melbourne. Um, so over here I'm hearing 400% increases in r- retail coffee sales in supermarkets. Yep, I've heard that as well. And retail – coffee in the supermarkets here in Australia has also gone through the roof. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We're hearing some of the bigger companies uh, in Sydney who were previously not on retail stores that are currently, I heard Campos went into uh, supermarket stores as of this Mm -hmm. week, I think. Um, Are you guys on supermarket stores? We have capsules in the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. um, But, yeah, uh, Campos is in the Woolworths. And they've got two lines in there. They've got their um, organic range and their regular range. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've got lots of shelf space and they must be doing very well out of that because yeah. I'm pretty sure they're nationwide now, Yeah, which is great, really good for them. Their and timing was spot on. Spot on and, and <laughs> it's good for the, the value chain that they support. Uh, Will Absolutely. is very active in – and shout out to Will. He's my, my ex-boss from many, many moons ago. Um <laughs> You know, he's someone who cares deeply about the value chain and the producers he supports. And so it's fantastic for the producers that he supports. And this is one of the really great Mm. outcomes of stuff like Cup of Excellence and people like Mm. him that have been involved in those kinds of things. As he succeeds, the producers he's supporting get to succeed year on year on year on year, which is the ultimate goal, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, Will's always been someone that I've um, looked up to as someone I'd like to emulate, you know. Um, his his style of buying and, like, his style of business is fantastic. Yeah. I remember when we were just, like, I'm talking oof, 13 years ago <laughs> when it was just one little store in in Newtown. And the mm-hmm. roastery yeah. was inside the store. That's right. Yeah. Right before it moved to Alexandria. And, it, you know, it was just crazy. People were waiting an hour for a coffee and we're making thousands of espressos a day. Mm. Yeah. And to know Amazing. that it's gone from that to 
the many, many millions of dollars worth of green coffee that's purchased every year is just, it's so exciting and great to see someone with his kind of intentionality behind the way mm-hmm. he wants to support the value chain, which is something that we're, you know, we as a as a brand, Map It Forward is like big on you knowing and having a connection. You don't have to know them personally, but having a connection with the people who own the farms that grow the coffee that you're selling. Absolutely. And I think that's really vital to doing good business as a as a buyer mm-hmm. and particularly in these times of COVID is having that connection and, and reaching out and talking to people and, and just trying to figure things out from their perspective. There's that whole empathy thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the whole empathy thing. Very important. Uh, ain't it just, I feel like that seems to be the baby that did get thrown out with the bathwater in times like this, but I'm hoping we mm-hmm. can claw our way back somehow. Um, tell me about some of the other origins that you're working with we went we mentioned brazil what are some what are some of the things that you're hearing look, out of other origins look another important one to talk about is peru um peru's being hit yeah. very hard as well i think they're in like the top five or something of um contagion rates um now peru is is a difficult country to start with even before covid um you know and i think before like so obviously we we all have the price crisis in, in our mind as well. Mm. Uh, then you layer on top of the price crisis COVID um, in a country that was already struggling with poverty and hunger and malnutrition and all of those things. But primarily for the coffee producers, let's really talk about transport. It's very difficult in that country to get coffee out of the ma- out of the mountains, the Andes, down to the ports is very difficult. Um, the roads are ridiculous. It's like I remember once being in a car for like four hours to get just to one producer from Lima and it was crazy actually no it wasn't from Lima it was from uh, Hayen yeah four hours from Hayen to get to this producer in the north of Peru the roads were terrible river crossings everything you can think of it was Mm -hmm. there so for these guys to get their coffee out normally is difficult but now trucks are only running a few days a week they're not running full time, so to get the coffee out's really hard. Um, a lot of producers are actually hoarding their coffee in in their own homes, like keeping it there until the prices go up enough and it makes sense for them to actually sell this coffee because it's it's just the the situation right now is so bad. I don't and they're all them. terrified of contagion. Mm. I'm also hearing that out of Peru that a lot of cherry is being left on trees. Is that the case? Yep. That is the case, yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard as well. Um, it's neighbours and family members are helping each other pick but they're not really wanting to bring in uh, additional pickers or they're unable to. That's another big one. There's a lot of people throughout Latin America are unable to get pickers. Um, Colombia is a big one for it, that right now. Exactly, yes, exactly. So, um, you know, I think that's, it's yeah, it's a bad situation over there for them. And, you know, the situation is kind of similar in Colombia, but they're a little bit more structured with the, the, with the FNC. Um, so they've got like this, uh, the federation that takes care of the producers, essentially. Um, it's like their, uh, it's like their union, I guess. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, and so they're a little bit more structured and, and they've got a little bit more ability. Workflow's a little easier, but in Peru, the workflow is not, not existent at the moment, really. This may sound like a silly question. I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm. Is this an opportunity mm. for local economies to, for local producers to start looking at perhaps a local consuming economy, cultivating that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I see COVID as an opportunity for a lot of things. Yeah, um, yeah. And that is definitely one of them. Um, it is an opportunity for us to as an industry and not just for the, just not all on the producers, Mm -hmm. this needs to be us as an industry to close that um, disparity, change the disparity up so that producers have more of a voice and they have more of a power. Uh, It is an opportunity for them to start getting into the market in other ways for maybe roasters and producers to team up and develop ideas to like new business plans, new models for them to be able to get more money and to make it more sustainable. The sustainability of the industry is something that's at risk at the moment. I'd say it's beyond 
being at risk, wouldn't you? I think that it's uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like let's I'm let's sure just drop the, the polite. <laughs> it's uh, I think we're we're at we're in the danger zone of it. You know, it, yeah, yeah. Well, we're 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 definitely um, at the point where if we don't if we don't pay serious attention to this now. Mm-hmm. Look, I was saying at the beginning of last year that we had probably eighteen to twenty four months, mm-hmm. um, like two two years worth, um, and this is. This is um, after a conversation, a couple of conversations I had with Mark Dundon. Um, and, you know, Mark's a mentor of mine and, and he was saying to me, like, listen, the window's closing quickly. Mm-hmm. If we don't fix this quickly, uh, we will go beyond the point of no return because there's too many factors in play that are, we have, we're pushing up against. So not only are we fighting a, a coffee price crisis, we're also fighting climate change and we're also yep. fighting an economic meltdown that's coming globally. And this was mm-hmm. the beginning of last year. Yeah. We hadn't even considered a pandemic at that point. Yeah, so now we've got the pandemic, which has then added a little more pressure to that economic crisis, which is now adding the potential of very real hunger crises in a lot of these countries. So tell me about the hunger crises. I'm, um, that's something I hadn't even thought about with regards okay, to Okay, so think about the States right now. Mm-hmm. The States is basically being brought to its knees um, <laughs> That's one with COVID. very polite way to say it. <laughs> You've got to stay polite, right? <laughs> I don't know about you Look. as an Australian, but <laughs> I'm all the about state, saying uh, it as it is. <laughs> you can say fuck as much as you want. really in tra- All right. Well, the states are fucked, right? Yeah, the, well, There's a lot yes. of trouble over there right now. Now, a huge number of the countries, particularly I'm thinking particularly in Latin America because it's so close, mm-hmm. right, in Central America, um, a lot of the money that goes into those countries, like say places like Honduras, Mm-hmm. actually comes from the states. It's from people who've moved to the U.S., um, legally or not, sending money back home yeah. into places like Honduras. That money is no longer flowing. So this has meant that the families back at home in Honduras are not only facing the situation of they can't go out of their homes or they can't move quite as easily to go and get food and such. I mean, some places like El Salvador have locked down completely. They locked down for something like 90 days where people could not leave their homes. Yeah, there was... Well, they could leave their homes, but they could only go to small areas. That was because of weather, right? There was big, massive storms in El Salvador? There were big, massive storms, but it's because of the guy running the joint. So, um... Okay. Bukele, uh, yeah, locking everyone down and making it very, very difficult for them to, to move around and get food. So this has meant that a lot of people who are already on the precipice of poverty, well, already on poverty, but the precipice of of hunger and like, you know, just not having enough. Their day-to-day, um, day-to-day cash flow has gone. So these people get up in the morning, go out, sell some vegetables and make some money. That means they can eat that day. Mm. But if they can't get out and sell those vegetables because of whatever laws are stopping them, they don't eat that day. So there's been people like actually without money and without food in a lot of these countries. Yeah, it's heavy. And it look, is extremely heavy. You know, we're here to have the difficult conversations. We're here to mm. you know, you're comparing you know, look, there's so many there's so many parts of this to dissect because we've got targets burning down here because, you know, fuck capitalism. And on the other side of the uh-huh. the value chain, we've got the necessity for the basics of capitalism required in order for people just to eat. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's a, <laughs> you know, there's a huge number of problems going yeah, on. Yeah, right there's now. a lot of grey area, you know, at, at the moment. Um, I think that our industry is trying to find a way not to navigate the nuance. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the point where we need to just stop and go, what can we yeah. do as a company, as an industry, as an individual? 
to fix this problem. What are some... Because... Go ahead. I was just going to say because we can't ignore it anymore. Yeah. What are some of the... God, fuck, there's so many different directions that I want to take that statement because ignoring it is... It's a luxury that we've afforded ourselves as an industry for about 40 years. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we had warning signs. And this Mm. pandemic has added to kind of saying, listen, we're going to push the hardest right now. And if you don't fix it now, it'll break after this. And Mm -hmm. we're at a breaking point. This has gone beyond yeah. being at risk. We're at a breaking point. So what, what does the breaking mm-hmm. point, once we pass that, what does it look like if we don't fix it? Look, I think it looks like coffee remaining cheap everywhere, commercial grade, specialty coffee be- becoming very separated. So you either have your high-end crazy geishas, roommate sedans, carbonic maceration, whatever, like super expensive, really high end, super expensive stuff, or you have your commercial because everywhere in between becomes no longer viable. It is no longer viable at this stage already. Um, it's, it's like opening a business and saying, I'm going to lose money every year. Cause that is what's currently happening. You can't produce great quality coffee, uh, cheaply. You just can't do it. It's impossible. I feel a need to talk about that at length, if that's okay. Um, that's perfectly right now, fine. I, um, I'm observing something a lot in our industry right now that I've really wanted to talk to somebody about on this podcast and I think you're the perfect person to, to have a discussion with it about. I'm hearing again and again people contacting me both from the producing end and from the consumer end saying, am I the only one who's not making money? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when I have these discussions with people and they say, you know, we'll go into it and we'll talk about the feeling of overwhelm and, and it's beyond overwhelm. It's, and, and it's not just a COVID-19 thing. This is something that's been going on for years, but they haven't known who to talk to about it or they've been ashamed about admitting it or they didn't want anyone to think that they were failing when everybody else seemed to be doing so well. This is systemic mm. in our industry. Yeah. It's, it's, yes, it uh, I wish we'd do away with the fuckery and just talk about what was going on as an industry. Mm-hmm. You know, if, yeah. if people weren't hiding the hurt as much as they were, we would be able Mm -hmm. to progress to just kind of letting go of the shame of the shame that we're experiencing as individual business owners. I just, I just had a call earlier today where a business owner that I'm coaching had said to me, listen, so many people are excited about me launching this business and I can't do it. And I just don't know how not to do it. Mm. And she, by the end of the call, you know, I said to her, you have to press pause on this. You have to just put this down, get everything together, figure out if this is what you want to actually do because we do not need another person in the industry who's just scraping by. And you don't need something in your life right now in amongst the fuckery that's going on that's weighing you down. Mm -hmm. And this is something that so many people don't want to admit to in our industry. And I feel like we need to give them a channel to kind of just put their hand up and say, you know what, me too. I, I also feel so weighed down by the pressure of surviving on one, two or three percent net profit. And I don't know how to do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to go into a business and only get, you know, one, two, three percent net profit. If that, if that, it just doesn't make sense. You may as well work for someone else in some big corporation and make a wage and 
you know, not have the stresses that are involved with and, it. And it's happening on both extremes of the value chain. It's, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the number of conversations that we've had with producers and importers on this podcast about like how do we how do we help producers with regards to this situation i mean most of them don't even have the luxury of having the bandwidth of being able to understand what their cost of goods are versus their cost of doing business yeah yeah exactly it's not something that they can do yeah but look, um, basically, you know, coffee producers have been subsidising our side, yeah. the consuming side, for a long time now. And when when the coffee prices were great, and I'm not talking about specialty, I'm just going to talk about coffee in general because the sea price is such a huge, mm. uh, you know, factor in this in this whole buckery, as you like to put it. Um, it's, it's the official definition <laughs> for the coffee industry, the wizardry and fuckery. I love it. I thought Great. of making that our tagline. wizardry line. and fuckery. Yeah. <laughs> we expose I the wizardry and fuckery that. of the coffee industry. I wasn't joking. <laughs> 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 hey, that was a oh, recent thought. I'm like, I'm going to update the website to have our tagline say, uh, our focus is exposing the wizardry and fuckery of the uh, coffee industry. I've hesitated thus far, but we'll see. Oh, Next it. week could be a different, I, bring a different thing. I think you should do it after this call <laughs> immediately. Oh, this is the time, right? Yeah, this is the time. Anyway, so look, um, when when the sea price was good, and you know we were selling our coffee for basically the same price we're selling our coffee for now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything was fine and everyone was winning. And then the sea price slumped. And then we had good old Roya or Rust come in and destroy crops all over the place and climate change became a problem. Um, and we really have never recovered from mm-hmm. those two things. So the sea price, um, as volatile as it is, it just seems to be even more volatile in the last five years or so. Um, mm-hmm. It just continues to be uh, just... Yeah, a problem, and it's not a problem that's going away. So, you know, and then on our side, we were selling our coffee at $3, I think, when I first started being a barista. Now we're selling our coffee for maybe like $4.50. It's not much of an increase. Prices have gone up on the producing side and on the consuming side for us to produce Mm. this cup of coffee. Um, And somewhere in between, all the money is lost. So no one's making any money on either end and in between somehow all that subsidy is, yeah. So help me understand something. (laughs) Consumed. For the last couple Mm. of years we've been trying to answer one big question, which is who's making money in the coffee value chain? Yeah. And I had Darren Daniel, uh, shout out to Darren from Cup of Excellence on the podcast last week. And he's fucking brilliant. I love that guy. And I love what Cup yeah, of Excellence are doing. Um, and the one mm-hmm. thing that I think that we've definitely found through our, all of our conversations on the podcast about this, and he confirmed it last week, is that the people who are making the bulk of the money in the coffee value chain are roasters. Mm-hmm. Except what is happening and why they're not seeing a lot of those profit and maintaining a lot of those profit margins is because the profits that they're making at the roastery are subsidizing the losses in the cafe. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It does make sense to me, yeah. You know, I think retail is problematic, Um, so having a cafe is quite problematic. (laughs) That's a kind of way to put it. (laughs) Because you have... I'm yeah, sure every cafe I mean, owner now is of... just cheering that, that they decided to open a cafe Yay. in the middle of a pandemic. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it's surprising how many have been opening yes. cafes. But, um, you know, you've got continuing pressures. Mm. So here in Australia, obviously, we had a lot of problems, if you've been kind of listening to the news over the last few years, with uh, wage mm. and wage theft and that sort of thing. So um, it's... It's a very complicated Talk thing, about wage, the wage theft. laws in Australia. Can you explain what wage theft is for people who don't know? 
Uh, so for um, for those people who don't know, in Australia, it was for the longest time, well, we've got very, very difficult wage mm. laws, um, very difficult to navigate. So there was a lot of um, a lot of cafes who were not paying their staff correctly um, as per the wage laws, um, and then that is called wage theft if you haven't paid quite enough. Um, so often, you know, it, they're not flexible enough, those, those wage laws, for everyday use so you know um oh i'm sick and i have to go home can you please cover the rest of my shift yeah sure no worries oh all of a sudden you've just broken the law um without actually realizing wow. it so um you know it's it can be quite it can be quite difficult um so we've had a lot of that coming out so wages are expensive they're very expensive here mm. in australia um you know i obviously I, I don't know the models of other countries um we have very high rents, we have very high food costs, and we have this real expectation of cafes here in Australia of having food, having coffee, having amazing service, having a beautiful ambience, which means a lot of money needs to go into it. So all of these owners that are coming from the wholesale side where we sell roasted beans to cafes, um, we get a lot of pressures from those cafe owners wanting price to be pulled down because essentially what are they trying to do? They're trying to make money they're mm-hmm. trying to make their little you know little bit of profit if they can scrape their little two percent together then they're mm-hmm. happy you know and back back in the day when everything was great in with the coffee, 90s we could <laughs> in the 90s or whatever we could make nice fat profits yeah. we could make 20 percent, 30 percent, whatever now we're going to make two percent we're going to be like oh good yay i can pay my bills and still make a little yeah. bit of money. Right? I remember, Lucy, when I was first in coffee and I haven't worked in anything but specialty. So mm. that was almost 20 years ago, out of, straight out of corporate. And I was asking all the stupid questions, you know. I'd n- never, ever mm. even done anything in the hospitality industry, had a science degree, went into corporate and then went straight into being a barista. Eight years after, <laughs> I'm like, fuck the corporate world. This isn't for me. I'm going to go make coffee for a living. And yeah. You know, I came into it and I said, I remember asking someone at the time, you know, like, what, what is coffee before they roast it? And, you know, he answered me and he said, it's, it's green coffee. I'm like, oh, okay, so how long can we keep coffee uh-huh. once it's in its green form? How long can you store it? And he said, six years. What? Yeah, but <laughs> remember, this is almost 20 years ago. And th- it yeah. was a different time. It was the beginning of specialty coffee in Australia. And yeah. the way that we looked at all of those things back then was, and this is one of the biggest specialty coffee roasters in Australia. It wasn't Campos. Um, it was, mm-hmm. you know, the, the roaster I worked for before that. And mm-hmm. It wasn't until going to Campos that I realized, oh, there's something new starting here. Yeah. That was the beginning of, you know, the new way of buying and buying from a producer and bringing it in. And, you know, Will had just started doing origin trips at that time, right at the beginning of Mm -hmm. all of it. And when we look at, the fact that 20 years ago it was an accepted kind of idea that you can store green coffee for six years. Yeah. It's like, okay, I can buy my soy milk because it, it lasts for three years. I can buy three years' worth, buy it all in bulk and just store it in a warehouse because I've got the warehouse anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a strange well. way of looking at the value chain back then compared to now. And people, you know, yeah. more wizardry and fuckery to reduce the, the kind of the margins that they were making, but now they have to compensate yeah. in different ways by this. You know, I heard the term um, uh, from Mark Dundon the first time, and Darren used it again last week. It must be a cup of excellence uh, crowd thing, but it, it's this race to the bottom of who can buy the yeah. cheapest coffee, and how do they? how do you use that as the mechanism to increase your profit margins? Because that seems to be the easiest mm-hmm. way for people to do it, considering they can't charge more to their customers. They just won't accept it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Customers won't accept a higher price. It's the simple solution, right? It's the easy way out. 
to just push down your prices and continue with this pressure of like pushing. You have bigger roasters who have uh, clients who will be asking them for ridiculous amounts, like ridiculous prices that are just really unobtainable in anything that has any form of quality or sustainability attached to it. Um, you're really just going to have to be buying bulk commercial to fill those requests. Um, and we, we have received them ourselves at the roastery I work at, you know. Uh, we receive these crazy prices and often we just will have to say, you know what, no, we can't, we don't do that. That is not what we do. I don't think we've mentioned yeah, it in this no conversation flex. yet where you work. Um, for anyone mm. who doesn't know who Lucy is, Lucy is the green buyer for St. Ali. And I didn't, I think I deliberately avoided mentioning that up front, not because I think that there's anything wrong with the fact that you work for St. Ali. It's just that it's not important. You're a green buyer and um, you have a plethora Correct. of experience around this subject. So you're here as a green buyer, not here as a representative of a specific company and I just kind of wanted to, sure. to make that is that cool <laughs> yeah that's cool that's perfectly cool I mean that's you know I'm I'm happy to just try and help people learn and we are I mean it, it, the for me the fun thing and the really great thing about these discussions is that we end up asking each other a lot of questions that most people are thinking in their cars or, you know, when they're closing their shops or when they're roasting. Um, we end up mm -hmm. talking about a lot of the things that most people question and don't know where to go to. And so it's why it's really important that we have people who are making those decisions for cafes that are, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I wonder what happens with the really big cafes. You know, what, what happens with the really yeah. popular brands? And St. Ali is a really popular brand in Australian the Australian coffee culture. It's known around the world. Yeah. And to know that, you know, nobody's immune from this. No one. Absolutely no one <laughs> is immune from this. It's scary as fuck, isn't it? Does it matter who you are? <laughs> oh, absolutely. This is, yeah, I mean, this is affecting everybody. Producers, it's affecting from, you know, your high-end specialty geisha producers down to your low-grade commercial producers. Everybody's being hit. And on our side, it can be the biggest roaster to the smallest roaster. Mm. We're all experiencing something out of COVID. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm excited at the way mm -hmm. that COVID is forcing us into a shock response because usually once the adrenaline wears off from a shock – you have the freedom within yourself to say, I don't want to experience that again. How can I be better at what I do? And I think this is one of the really exciting, um, I don't like the word positive um, because, you know, it means something different to everyone. But I think it's one of the um, more functional as opposed to dysfunctional things that's happening out of this. There's a lot of dysfunction going on. Mm -hmm. But one of the more functional mechanisms that's being triggered here is it's forcing people into a situation of analysing the way that they participate in the value chain. Absolutely, absolutely. This is an opportunity for change and it's an opportunity for us to have a really good reflection on what we're doing and how we can use this situation to yeah, be better. How is this changing your job as a green buyer? So it's been very challenging last few months, um, I'll be honest. It's been interesting to try and uh, navigate this crazy world. But also because um, not just from the fact that, you know, sales dropped and all that sort of thing and I was like, oh, my goodness, what do I do? How do I, how do I make sure that I'm still staying true to all of my mm. promises, to all of my producers, buying the coffees and and making sure that I have a home for everything and my prices are still staying good, all of that stuff, right? But there's also like, what are we going to pivot into? What are we going to change into as a business, as, as, as an industry? How is this, like, what does the future look like? Because before the future was pretty simple, kind of knew what it looked mm. like. We kind of knew, okay, so in 12 months we'll be doing X, Y, Z. Now I'm like, in 12 months, what are we going to be doing? I, I don't know. I think that there's about <laughs> you know. four more planetary crises that are supposed to happen from now to, the to, to if 2020 is any indication. Well, 
Look, it seems like every month <laughs> there's something new and interesting. So um, waiting maybe next month there will be some, like, I don't know, giant chicken or something. Asteroids. You know, that will come in. Either asteroids, asteroids or, or aliens. Just Aliens are possible. Yeah. I just, I just like the idea of giant beasts knocking down cities. That would be cool. Okay. Um, down, Godzilla that wasn't style. on my list, but I will add that to my list. I'll look out for that. I mean, right now anything's a possibility. Well, you know, we've – Plague, pestilence, we've had it all, fires, floods. Targets burning down, you know. Walmarts going crazy, all of it. Exactly, exactly. So does, does – Who knows? Oh, shit, fuck, tell me about it. Um, <laughs> here you get – I know this is going to sound a bit intense, but you do get worried about okay. listening to the news. Yeah, because you turn on the news, you're going to hear something else bad. Yeah. Great. I've limited it to one time a day. I'm allowed to listen to it in the morning and then I don't listen to it mm-hmm. again until the next morning. There's too much shit to get done to be bogged down with the anxiety. I just can't – I have a propensity towards being triggered through anxiety and so I have to manage my mental health that way. It's just too much. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, for me, I've been pouring through all the coffee news that I can – possibly fine because I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in each of the countries that I purchase yeah. from and from Australia as well. And it's sort of the, the day-to-day normal news is not something that's really been in the forefront no. of my mind. It's more like what's going on in coffee industry yeah. today. Cool. Google yeah. Alerts is fantastic for that. I have Google Alerts set up for all of the a lot of the origin countries. So I set them up mm. for, you know, I, I know that there is – corruption in coffee in Kenya allegations happening today because there's a Google alert that I've got set up um, (laughs) that kind of sends me all the articles that are around coffee that have the keywords coffee in Kenya um, in them Mm. and so for me that's a way that I can kind of stay up to date on that stuff without having to listen to any other kind of news it's just easier and you get the news locally that way so the articles that come to me are from the Kenyan newspapers in English, which is... Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I remember telling somebody that and they're like, oh, I should start doing that. Everybody in coffee should start doing that, I think. Absolutely. I'm going to be setting that up as soon as we finish this good, call. Good, I good, good. <laughs> I found that I tend to be able to um, see things happening a little bit before they <laughs> end up eventuating in the industry mm. at this end of the value chain because of that. But it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. interesting. Um, tell me more about how your job has changed. Um, so I have had quite a lot of time uh, packing coffee and doing all sorts of other things. Um, so it's become uh, obviously we had to let quite a few staff go, but we've also had to, um, you know, make lots of shifts shorter and mm. stuff like that. So people aren't working as much, and so I haven't been working as much as normal. Um, but I've also been working in all sorts of different parts of the role. So it's kind of like um, going back like five years and nice. doing different things. So, you know, I, I've had the luxury of being able to just do the one job for a while now, so just doing buying and quality control, so just cupping and buying coffee all day. It's a fantastic luxury. It's amazing. <laughs> but COVID has taught us to be more uh, resourceful, yep. obviously, um, and go back to that, like everybody has to do a little bit of everything mm-hmm. and chip in and that sort of small company mentality. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's been actually really fun and it's been really good bonding experience for, for all of the team. Um, and we've been, you know, doing crazy pivots. Like, uh, we started selling uh, sanitizer and we started selling hand cream. Who's and, making it? You know, <clears throat> uh, we've got, uh, I've got a, a bottle here. <laughs> it's being made by a, a company called Hydrochem, um, and now and now hand cream. Oh, well. awesome! Um, <laughs> well, everybody has to adapt we, now, don't they? It, it, exactly, and you know, we sent a bunch of staff that we would have had to lay off otherwise uh, to go and work at Hydrochem, and they all worked there in the chemical factory for wow. months, and now they've we're able to bring them back on again, and. Um, yeah, it's it's been fantastic. You know, uh, we, we're able to keep seventy something plus jobs on because of that, because of that pivot. And then, um, you know, we had another another opportunity to open up our store as a bit of a grocery store because we've got amazing chefs. They could make take home mm. meals and all that sort of thing. And 
Yeah. I've got to say, um, you do have great chefs at St. Ali. Really, oh, really do. fucking good we chefs. Do. <laughs> Sal definitely and, got uh, that right. <laughs> He definitely got that right. You know, and and that's something that we're going to continue doing yeah. past COVID. We're going to be doing all of these things after it. Um, you know, it's it's opened up new opportunities for us. Um, you know, retail has become a huge part of what we do, online retail. Um, we've started doing more subscriptions and more more everything, mm. really. It's it's actually been very interesting to see the business adapt and change. How have you witnessed shifts in leadership? Have you noticed that that has been, for me, it's been fascinating to watch leaders really find their lane in times of of crises like this? Um, And COVID has definitely been a more obvious crisis than, I guess a better way to say that is, it's been a crisis that kind of, stung more than the coffee price crisis Mm -hmm. was obviously stinging people it's like a you know boiling someone slowly to their death is the Mm. the coffee price crisis that's what it's doing to the industry whereas covid kind of like yeah march 15th fuck you very much and that's it the industry died yeah well look let's look at it from this way um on our side both yours and mine, um, we see what's right in front of us. Right. And what's right in front of us right now is COVID. And the price crisis never really affected us. And in fact, we benefited from price crisis. What do you mean by that? We benefit in a big way. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it means the that prices we, were so low. we can purchase coffee right. cheaper. So that means we get a fatter margin. Mm. Great, awesome, but not so great for the producers. Right. Whereas the producers, they're the ones who are being faced with this price crisis and have been losing money for years yeah. now. Um you know, having this business that they're trying to make ends meet with, that that was extremely painful for them and it continues to be extremely painful for them. And then, uh, but for us, we're seeing COVID and it's affecting us straight away, um, you know, and um, I'm going to say uh, Ada Batley said to me that it's like our, uh, it's like our rust, it's like our Roya and we're, we're now suffering from that, we're now feeling the the hurt and the pinch and it's just spreading like crazy this 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 virus that we can't control we've got absolutely no control we've completely lost control um the only thing we can do is try and you know protect ourselves with masks or whatever but everything else is goodness knows what's going to happen right um so that's why it pinches so much that's why it hurts so much on our side because we are feeling it and i feel like we've as a society as a a consumer based society on this end of the value chain we've done very well at insulating mm. ourselves from the consequences of the coffee price crisis because mm-hmm. the thing that the element that you need to feel the coffee price crisis before this if you're on the consumer end is empathy mm-hmm. yes. you could avoid Knowing yes, anything did. about it if you didn't have empathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what I think we started to see was people who have a very close connection to the value chain, mostly, uh, sorry, to the producing end of the value chain, mostly the green coffee buyers mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, people who actually build relationships with producers, that empathy was unavoidable because you were having mm. conversations directly with the people that were being affected. Whereas people who've chosen mm. not to engage in that way of participating had the luxury of quarantining themselves, you know, to borrow mm. a term from our current clusterfuckery. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, it's, exactly. It's the, word, the, uh, the crisis that keeps on giving. Um this, isn't it? But it's one of those things where now we can no longer be quarantined from it. And now that we've removed that, that veil that kept us separated from the coffee price crisis, which was empathy, uh, because we find ourselves equally as fucked as the producers right now, yeah. we're getting the onslaught of all of it at the same time. 
Exactly. You know, exactly. You know, I feel like in Australia we're, we're doing really quite well, uh, obviously with the COVID and everything like that, and we're starting to recover. And I Hold do that worry <laughs> that that will take... 2020, we're not done with it well, yet. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> no, we're, no, we're not done with it yet. But I do worry that that will take uh, people's focus off the price crisis and off the, the current situation um, in Australia. And we'll just be like, oh, sigh of relief. Okay, that's over. Back to normal business. But it can't be back to normal business because we're doing okay, but everyone else over there, not so much. Yeah, the. I mean, even though before the next wave, let's hope it doesn't happen, but it's definitely happening mm. over here. It's already started. But yeah, let's hope Australia does avoid a second wave. And we're hearing even in like places like Melbourne and Sydney, we're hearing clusters of new cases pop up in different communities and whatnot. Yeah. Little spot fires happening, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it seems like one crisis tends to borrow terms from another crisis. You know, you had the fires and now you've got... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty shocking. Um, yeah. It doesn't end. But, I mean, are you are you guys at all worried about a second wave? Yeah, we're worried about it. But I think um, the government's trying to nip it in the bud early and I think they're doing all the right things um, to try and prevent it from really flaring up. Uh, yes, we are worried about a second wave, but I think what – um, like as a roasting business, what we're mostly concerned about is further lockdowns and further like like extensions of restrictions because that's where we really start to feel the pinch, um, you know, without people coming into our cafes. And we're a roastery with quite a lot of cafes. Mm -hmm. um, without people coming into those cafes, uh, we, we're just not making the turnover that we need to make. And like – Obviously, quite a few of our cafes are shut down. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our cafes are in the, the central business di district. So being in the CBD means that uh, there's just no one around. It's a ghost mm -hmm. town in the CBD in Melbourne. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of offices that are going to continue working from home probably for quite some time. If not ever. Many of our, if not ever, many of our wholesale clients have started to feel that pinch. Um, we've had a few that have had to, you know, close up shop for good. Yeah, and that's very very sad. But um, you know, I think these these lockdowns are the they're the real pain for us. I'm hearing a bunch of people in Australia say that they're not worried about making it to September because there's a lot of relief mm -hmm. coming from the government up until then. It's post September yep. that people are really worried about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. So we've got this thing called JobKeeper, which is helping people pay mm -hmm. wages. Um, and essentially it's like each, each staff member gets like, I don't know, I can't remember how much it is, but it, it's, it's a big chunk of your wages gets paid. Mm -hmm. um, in September they're going to be cutting that job keeper um, and no longer will you be getting subsidised. So therefore businesses will no longer be able to pay wages, which will probably increase the uh, unemployment rate, which is currently sitting at around seven, just over seven percent. I can't remember what the last figure was, God, but we um, it's it, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's bad for. Oh, Australia. it really we is. We're normally around about yeah, we're normally about five, and I remember when it was years ago, it got to nine percent or ten percent or something, and they were freaking out. So at seven, just over seven percent, they're really starting to freak out quite a bit. Mm. I suspect in September we will possibly be reaching that 10. Um, and, yeah, I know in the States it's, what's 40 or something at the moment? It's crazy, 45 right? 45 million people officially unemployed. And, I mean, that's massive. That's really, really huge. Um, and, you know, on average it's between a, a million and two million every week uh, new registrations of unemployment. Wow. That's just, yeah. That's unbelievable. And people don't realise that pe – people think that it's COVID that crashed the economy. People are not realising mm. that, hey, like, do you know that we were officially declared in a recession in February? Yeah, it was already happening. Right? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing is people think this massive tsunami turned up and it was called COVID-19. And, and mm. when this tsunami turned up – it crashed and destroyed the economy. 
But what they don't realize is that there were two tsunamis and one showed up ever so slightly before the other. So you didn't notice that it was two tsunamis that were coming. Mm. And one mm. of them was the collapse of the, the economy because of a recession. And the other one was yeah. COVID-19. And they turned up at virtually the same time. So nobody noticed. And people are saying, wow. you know, it's, it's fine because, you know, people being a lot of orange haired politicians, uh, <laughs> I don't like to name him. Um, mm. But what he's saying is that if we restart the economy, if we just get businesses back, mm. it will fix everything. Now, that's, mm -hmm. that's a lie because the econ economy mm. was in a lot of trouble before the tsunami that is COVID-19 hit. And even if we get everyone back, that's a, a whole bunch of falsehood right there because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And so 45 million unemployed right now, in July, at the end of July, the money runs out here. Yeah, yeah. The federal unemployment, so they're subsidising people's, uh, so he, it's a state and federal um, system, so you, you get your state unemployment, which in some, com in some states it's a couple of hundred dollars, here in California it's about $400. And then you get uh -huh. a $600 federal unemployment subsidy. And, and everybody who's un yeah. on unemployment is getting that. That $600 goes away at the end of July. Wow. And yeah. so when that – unless Congress can figure out where the fuck they're going to find enough money to give $600 to – it'll probably be somewhere around the 50 million people on unemployment by then. Where do you mm. where do you get? I mean, I don't know that kind of money. Yeah, I just yeah. and and increasing, businesses are feeling the pinch more and more. The longer they have to go, every month, being under the debt of not being able to pay rent again this month, the mm -hmm. more they're inching closer towards closing for good. Yeah, and with an imminent yeah. housing crisis about to happen. Mm hmm. I, I just don't – I'm excited for all the change that this is going to, to bring. I really am. Yeah. But in order for us to be motivated to make the necessary changes to our world and to our individual habits, we're going to have to mm -hmm. feel the pain points of what continuing as we currently are is going to result in. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I'm also seeing that mirrored in coffee. Like if we don't change what the way we're doing everything, we're not going to have access to coffee. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I think, you know, uh, look, I think coffee's not going to go away. It's just how and what sort of coffee we access, right? Um, is, yes, the climate crisis is equaling less and less Arabica, but there's always, you know, Robusta's still there. <laughs> so we'll be drinking more yeah. of that, you know. Will people um, want to? And we've got, I don't know, I think a lot of consumers um, in Australia will still want to drink it because they just want their caffeine fix, right? Yeah. It's, it's a, it'll change, you know, absolutely. But um, people, people are addicted to coffee. That's a great thing, right? It's a fantastic thing <laughs> it's for fantastic us. It's fantastic for us. So they're going to they're gonna keep drinking coffee. But whether they want to pay that money or not, considering the fact that there's such huge unemployment, I don't know. It may become less important to have a special cup of mm. coffee and just to have a cup of coffee. And I often think about specialty in another way as well. Like we're always thinking higher points, higher prices, higher, 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 mm -hmm. right? But when I look at what our consumers are doing, like our actual customers, drinking cups of coffee in their homes or in cafes um, when they get the opportunity to. <laughs> um, they're looking for a cup that gives them some sort of emotional They want a hug connection. from their cup of coffee. They want a hug from their cup of coffee. And that hug 
takes them back to their first few experiences with coffee. Did you ever use the which unfortunately is Nescafe Blend Forty Three? <laughs> exactly. Oh, with milk and two sugars. Back when I was at university. <laughs> exactly, and you know what? In Australia, it continues to yeah. be that they said that something like seventy percent of all coffee drunk in the home in Australia is instant yeah. coffee. So, we have a stick mm. stuck up our proverbial ass as an industry, thinking that we know better than the person who's drinking the cup of coffee what they should be drinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all I want to do as a buyer is get better coffee into more hands and having people ripped off less because you see people going into the big companies um, that are selling commercial grade coffee for the same prices that. We're selling specialty grade coffee, and I'm like, people, please, you're getting a poorer quality co- uh, product for the same price that I can give it to you. Can I just get better coffee into your hands? I just want people to have better coffee, um, you know, and for that to be a fair system across. But that's where the pro- that's where the cancer is, right? That's where the cancer it's is. This yeah, idea, absolutely. You know, and now we're getting to the heart of like the collision of all of the crises that are going on right now, whether it be the price crisis, Mm. the COVID-19 situation, the race issues that are going in, it's that sweet spot of fairness that seems to get, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the word is, perhaps it's, it, it gets corrupted by corruption. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and that's, To me, that's the fascinating part about all of it. You know, we hear people saying right now, fuck capitalism. Really? You know that device that you're holding in your hand that's giving you the microphone that allows you to post on social media, that that thing that you're saying, fuck capitalism, you have that because of capitalism. It's not fuck capitalism. It's fuck corruption. Yeah. That's what you want to be talking about right now. Exactly. Yes. A hundred percent, you know, um, we look at the we look at the coffee industry and we say, oh, it's unfixable. It's, just, it's it is fixable. It's not unfixable. It's completely yeah. fixable. It's completely fixable. We just have to suck it up, take less money in our pockets as roasters, um, take less money in our pockets, and make sure that that money is going where it needs to go, and the whole chain becomes equal. Help. And give more power to producers. Because that's the problem as well. Producers don't have well, the power. Now you're sounding we have far too leftist, lady. <laughs> I know, but we hold the keys. So, and this is the part of it that, <laughs> um, and for any of you that are going to contact me and say, you know, are uh, you a Republican? Blah, blah. I know I'm not any left or right. I'm as in the middle as you get um, with this stuff. The part of it that, that irks me is that we are and this is probably as left as I'll ever get uh, we're profiting off other people's pain and that's the part of it that doesn't sit well with me I don't have a problem with people making a profit but when you Mm -hmm. start to profit off other people's pain this is the part of the this is the unfair circle of the mm-hmm. collision of all of these, in, the intersection of all of it, where I have a real problem. Because once you're profiting yeah. off other people's pain, it's a different value statement then. Yeah, yeah. Look, everybody needs to make a profit, all of us, yeah. in order for this to be sustainable. Yeah, there, there shouldn't be At any moment, shame in that. Exactly. And all of us aren't making a profit at the moment and that is the way the problem is and unfortunately the ones who are not making the profit are the producers producers are the ones who are suffering yeah and it's been, you know it's this is our history this is what we've always done and we need to change it i think covid gives us a real perspective on what that looks like for the producer help me understand something why is it What's the part of the puzzle that people are missing from if I don't pay producers a fair price, that farm could potentially close and therefore my supply chain goes away? Which part of that, that yeah, don't okay. they realise? So, 
say you've got a producer that you really enjoy getting the coffee from. You love drinking yeah. that coffee. It's fantastic. And you are getting pressures. I'm just talking as a green buyer, right? You're getting pressures to pull that price down or not to increase the price or you know, whatever. Um, every year that that producer contain, uh, continues in production, their prices, their costs of um, like inputs into the farm, so fertilisers and things like that, cost of labour is going up. But we're staying stagnant on the price or we're pushing down on the price, which means their margin is eroding year by year by year by year. Um, and then, of course, they have climate to worry mm -hmm. about because this is an agricultural product we're talking about. Agriculture doesn't play nice. It's no. not It's not straightforward. Um, so they've got a lot of their own pressures that are going on. And if we continue to push on price or not move on price, that means that things will have to start, like, giving for that farm to continue making enough money to feed their family or and whatever. And what you mean by giving so is maybe, quality drops, they have to. They have to exactly. Yeah. So maybe they'll be less fertilising. Maybe maybe they won't fumigate as much or whatever they need to do. Yield drops. Uh, maybe whatever. they won't. Yield will drop. Quality will drop. Eventually we end up with a quality that's not so great. And here we are on our high horses, especially coffee people, going, ah, oh, your coffee was an 87 last year and this year it's an 86 so therefore I won't buy it this is we can't have our cake and eat it too and you know um is that where the problem this lies? is a this is this is one of the problems absolutely it's the sense There's of entitlement over being able to tell people you have to meet this standard or more year on year this is this is where we hold the keys this is where our power yeah, wow. is okay yeah so instead of say, uh, and you know, I really don't like to draw wine and coffee together and that. that sort of thing. But a winemaker will say, "Here's your here's your product. It is as good as it's going to get. Um, and yes, it's going to be different year by year by year. Every year is different. And we celebrate that vintage mm. in coffee. We don't celebrate the vintage, so to speak. We just say, well, why isn't your coffee the same as it was last year? Why not?" Well, uh, it's agricultural. But our it's customers a don't care. Organic so product. why are we the gatekeepers of entitlement? Yeah, because we like to nasal ga navel gaze a lot, and we like to uh, please ourselves somehow. Mm. I don't know. I mean, uh, this is this is part of you know. I love specialty coffee, and I love what it does for the industry. I, like I love that it elevates producers and gives them the opportunity to make money. I love that. But there's also a lot of problems because we're really disconnected from the broader consumer. So we're really mm -hmm. disconnected from people who just want to have a have that hug cup of coffee every day. Yeah, it's the wizardry and fuckery um, again. Right? We, yeah, and we're unable to get that message across to those consumers. Like we're unable to say like this is why you need to pay more for your coffee or this is what the importance is. Um, we have been trying to say it the same way for ever. And like all of us are, um, all of us have been doing this. So we will say to our consumers, "This is such and such variety from such and such an altitude from this particular producer," and we try and come up with some sort of story or whatever. But that doesn't resonate they don't with care. the consumer. I, 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 yeah, you know, I, and we, we we have this little wedge in of, of the pie of coffee consumers. We've got this little tiny wedge, and it grows a little and. It, shrinks a little grows a little and I feel like at the moment it's kind of shrinking mm -hmm. a bit because we've got people who are just going you know what? I just want my cup of coffee and I, I don't want to have to think about it I really don't want to have to deal with that you know um we're unable to put ourselves in the in the same market as like craft breweries have where they've elevated commercial beer and made it into something that everybody wants um we're unable to do what wineries have done we're unable to do what even like bread has done you know you've got your regular supermarket bread or you've got yeah. your sourdough and everyone's like yes i really want to go and get that sourdough because it's so good this is an artisanal People product pay that seven dollars even twelve dollars for a, a loaf of bread in a, a, a good sourdough loaf in without yeah, blinking without blinking and and they want that and there's many of them out there who will do it week after week after week and not go to the supermarket bread in fact they won't even touch that stuff right um, but coffee has not been able to make that like, kind of differentiation between this is commercial and mm. this is artisanal. You know what I think it is? 
forgive me if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you will be sick to death of hearing me say this, but um, I've never had a conversation with Lucy before. So Lucy will never have heard me say this and I'm having a conversation with Lucy right now. So I think that we've got a problem. <laughs> I think we've got a branding problem in coffee. And I think that yeah. coffee as a, a commodity – well, coffee in general has a branding problem because we call instant coffee coffee and we call, um, you know, a $100 a cup from the Alita Estate in Panama, we call that coffee as well. Mm-hmm. And, and it's all brown. And it's all brown. It all looks the same. You can add milk and sugar to all of it. And if you add milk and sugar, it's going to taste sweeter, which to most people means better. And... Mm-hmm. The majority of people are not trained to drink um, a coffee that is recognisable through its nuance. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have somebody <laughs> that's trying to get your attention in the background there? <laughs> yeah, they're just like, mm. I'm in the boss's uh-huh. office and uh, I think he's just turned okay. up. <laughs> and he's going to get surprised to know that you're having a, a doing a podcast in his office? Oh, well, he'll, he'll deal, deal with it. Mm. Um, you know, these are mm-hmm. cu- times of crisis. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll exactly, figure out how to you get... know. You just, <laughs> we you all got to do what you got to do, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so, so exactly. my thing is like if we don't address the branding crisis that coffee's experiencing right now, mm. I fear that specialty coffee won't have the runway that it needs to fix itself. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does make sense, absolutely. Um, You know, I think uh, we, like, specialty coffee is trying to become more user-friendly, I guess, out of of COVID, something that I've definitely seen. You know, we've had uh, Toby's Estate develop these little, like, teabag type things, and I've seen, you know, uh, Veneziano Coffee Roasters have got their little uh, cans of coffee, um, you know, Blue Bottle and Stumptown did, like, those milk beverages years ago. We're trying to make specialty coffee more, uh, you know, more consumer. I think they're trying to make specialty coffee ready. more novelty from, mm. as opposed to approachable. Yeah, yeah. And it's, they're not making it more approachable. They're just making it easier to use for a broader consumer, yep. um, which, I th- which I think is, is quite cool because if it, does actually get some of the people who are drinking commercial coffee to drink better coffee, um, which as you know now is my aim, um, then great, awesome. We're getting specialty coffee into more hands. But the price points of all of these things are still something that will, you know, uh, probably drive a lot of consumers away. And, yes, you're right, it does make it more novel and specialty coffee in itself is about novelty. Mm -hmm. It's about... Uh, the way we've we've kind of approached it, particularly I think in the last I don't know, maybe like five or six years or something like that, we've been approaching how weird can we make coffee. It's not necessarily like um, how consumer friendly can we make coffee yeah. and still remain like high grade quality, right? Just straight up quality. Is it clean of defects? Is it nice and sweet is it nice and balanced has it got some complexity great but now we're like how complex can we get it um how weird can we make it how far away from that concept of coffee can we make this thing it's like i'm just thinking about it then it's like you know you again i don't want to draw a parallel with wine but i'm going to anyway Mm. it's like Mm. you've got the grangers of the wine in the wine industry and they figured out how to separate out the Grangers to be the elite version of wine and make them more expensive. Mm-hmm. And we're yep. the Grange of the coffee industry, but we didn't from the beginning set the standard that we should be more expensive as well. And so people just exactly. lumped us in with everything else. And that was our failing, our forefathers' failing. Exactly, yeah. It- Exactly. It's on us. We really stuffed up. 
um, you know, and I just, yeah, we can fix it. But I think as an industry, the specialty coffee industry, it needs to kind of work together to do that. And it's not something we're very good at. It's working together. At the moment, <laughs> the only thing the industry seems to be wanting to work at is cancel culture. I've, I, mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really at a point right now where I'm um, – talking to lots of people about how do we learn to elevate each other as opposed to Mm -hmm. cancel each other because everybody's doing it really hard right now. There's nobody that's doing it easy. No, no, it's, it's, it's a very difficult time for all of us. And I think, yeah, the only way out of this and the only way to make this really like sustainable in the future is to work together. Are you optimistic about that? realistically I am am optimistic I know that you're you're... like realistically (laughs) look I am very sad about what's happening in our industry and I'm very sad to see everything that's going on I'm very sad about COVID affecting so many people so deeply Mm. but I also like to stay really optimistic about it otherwise well you know just what do you do you just you're gonna go into a little uh, ball and rock in the corner you know Um, you you don't want to be that that dark about it because I I honestly think that we can find opportunity here and I honestly think that as an industry we can make we can really make something happen we just have to act on it where does the opportunity lie for producers here for producers it's about them just like us in cafes and roasteries is pivoting and changing the way that they think so as I said before it's about um maybe partnering up with your roaster and trying to do projects or something together to boost both of you. It has to be a partnership. can't just be the uh, roaster purchasing from the producer anymore. It, we need to work together. Um, you know, and producers can do things like roasting or that sort of stuff as well, although that is more capital. Um, but there are definitely ways we can we can reach to the consumer because the producer hasn't had a voice direct to the consumer in the past. This has always been us talking for them. We've always been their mouthpiece and that has to change. And is it changing? That's something that I think it can. How do I we do that? It necessarily is that much. It's changing a little bit in that pointy end of specialty. So how do we actively start that? Like a lot of people that are listening to this are going to turn around and say, all right, so give me some some functional things that I can do to engage because I want to be a part Mm -hmm. of fixing this. Yeah, absolutely. So contact your favourite producer, have a discussion with them about whether they want to work with you on a project selling maybe that if you can sell their beans through your cafe or your roastery or whatever um, and they get back a fatter profit but they also have a full ownership over that project, not just you having ownership over that project that doesn't work. Or maybe it can work the other way around and you can somehow help them set up a roastery in their producing country or help them do, you know, um, whatever action it is that they've got. There's, you know, there's a lot of really well-connected, really intelligent producers in their own countries that are able to do amazing things. They've, They've, you know, gone to business school or gone to engineering schools and, able to really make a difference in their own communities because we look at um, the coffee consuming culture in a lot of producing Mm -hmm. countries and it is going up it is really exciting to see well out of necessity but also out of passion a lot of these people so uh, you think about it producers um, haven't been making a lot of money for a long time Um, so why wouldn't you just close the doors and walk away like honestly why wouldn't you if yeah. I had a business and I wasn't making money, I would shut the doors. Um, but why do they do it? Because they're passionate about it. There's so much heart involved. So these countries have started to develop these amazing consumer cultures. And their amazing consumer cultures can be things like um, great cafes, great hangout spaces. I've seen some beautiful, like, um, beautiful places in like Colombia is one that I always like to go back to all the time because I have been going to Colombia for as long as I've been buying Mm -hmm. coffee and I remember when I first turned up there was like this little container bar Azahar coffee and many like people who are listening will know Azahar um and they excite me very much because this this is a company that's done amazing things so shout out to Tyler and the team um 
But it was just like this little container bar and they were trying to sell specialty coffee. And they were doing a pretty good job. They had some like, you know, a little bit of stuff at home retail kind mm-hmm. of thing, but it's not really a big deal in Colombia. Now they've got two great cafes, amazing cafes. Um, that are absolutely beautiful and they look like they could have, they could be in Melbourne, honestly. Wow. Um, and they're exporting coffee. They're roasting for the home market, which has now increased mm-hmm. greatly. And then they've got um, in Colombia as well another company called Pergamino that's got a few cafes as well. Again, beautiful, stunning cafes that look like they could be in Melbourne. Um, and there's a bunch of other little cafes that have popped yeah, up. That's and, awesome. you know, this specialty, specialty culture is really developing. And as these countries develop and as, they're, um, as they become richer and richer, they're able to have these things. And it's fantastic to see. Um, I think there's great opportunity to build on these cultures that are already starting. It's like it's like going back to Melbourne years ago when, or in Australia years ago when you were first working for Campos. It's like that mm. now. It's that exciting time, that time where you're like, there is something yeah, going on Yeah, you definitely here. knew it back then, didn't you? I, re- I remember when, you when did. St. Ali opened, uh, when Mark yep. had it. I remember mm-hmm. I hadn't been to Melbourne ever at that point and I, m- my husband, um, now ex-husband, is a mechanic and he loved coffee. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said to him, listen, I want to go to Melbourne and go to this cafe called St Ali. Um, everyone's talking about it and I think it's definitely, I think there's something really exciting happening in our industry that's going to change the way that we do everything. Exactly. So why don't we take all our knowledge and all of the the pitfalls we've found and all the times we've tripped over as roasters and in these consuming countries and apply that into those countries? Why don't we help them find their feet in this industry and become the sellers? Like this is the this is the way to make more money in these in these company in these countries. When we're off air, I'm going to talk to you about a, a project that uh, we're working on putting together that's hopefully coming out next at, later this year, that uh, now that I know that this is something that you're passionate about, I think that you might um, be someone that should be involved in this project. But uh, we'll talk about it off air. Cool. Um, it's directly related to what you're talking about and we started working on it this week. Uh, it's so funny that you should say what you just said, knowing what I know about <laughs> what this project is. But anyway... Um, Okay, so when you say all of that, yeah, people who are listening at home are thinking, I don't know any producers. How do I, cool. how do I contact a producer whose co- coffee I like roasting? Well, here's the other thing, you know, maybe we don't and – not all of us have the great privilege of being able to go and travel and visit people. Mm-hmm. But we have exporters and exporters who are, and importers as well, who are really conscious about that sort of stuff. And I'm going to say, obviously, straight off the bat, that Azahar is one of them, um, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, with a little bit of research, there's a lot of great exporters and importers who are doing legitimate projects in their country of origin or in specific countries we've got someone coming to on the help podcast next week that's it. that's going to talk a lot about that as well um go ahead yeah then. sorry yeah uh, there's a, there's a lot of those kind of companies out there that are doing great things and it's about teeing up with those you know teeing up with those types of companies and saying you know what can we do how can we apply our knowledge in these countries and help them build a consumer culture do you think that they'll – I mean, are importers hurting as much as I assume they're hurting right now? Yeah, I think they're hurting, absolutely. Of course they are. Um, you know, they'll be sitting on stock, some of them, that they can't mm-hmm. sell because roasters have stopped buying. Um, and particularly, you know, we've got these smaller roasters who don't have the privileges that I do of being able to travel overseas yep. and being able to buy – forward contracts and things like that. They might just be buying spot. what's called spot yeah. coffee, so warehouse coffee. Um, and, you know, that stock's going to be sitting there for 
extended periods of time, which will then mean they'll have to discount that stock in order to get it out the door. Or they'll just have to, I don't yeah, well, they'll have to discount it because they have to sell it, right? Um, they, they, they've got the same problem as us. Once you've got the product, you have to move it. Yeah. Um, and then they've also got the problems of, like, uh, decreased board contracts and people trying to extend contracts as well. So they'll be extending how long they're going to be holding their stock for. That's probably been a massive one, I would say, for a lot of importers. Um, yeah, just not as much flow through. Do you through. think that, that being that there's so much grey around that stuff, do you think that importers would be open to ideas from, say, a roaster decides that they do want to build a, a, a relationship with a producer from, you know, this coffee that they're, they're buying if they were to contact an importer and say, can you introduce me to that producer? Is that something? Yeah. You know what? I think absolutely because in these times we all need to think creatively mm. and they they understand it just as much as we do. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they're, you ahead. know, from every, from every importer that I've ever worked with, they've always been happy to do yeah, that. Yeah, awesome. To introduce me to someone. Yeah. How do you combat the language barrier no oh, that's always fun um <laughs> charades <laughs> charades is great um i've been doing duolingo but i'm really useless at it um <laughs> wow. and then just uh trying to get someone to be with me who actually can speak the language um it's i always feel so guilty because i've been buying coffee since 2013 or something like that and um the fact that my Spanish is still less than less than useful uh, is embarrassing. Are you working on changing <laughs> but that? I've always, yeah, I'm working on changing that. It's uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a slow work in, pro- in progress, but we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. It, I think I just need to go somewhere for three months and just you know be left yeah. in on a farm somewhere with no English. Some people's brains, <laughs> my brain's not wired to learn languages. So I can spend any, mm. t- I mean, I speak two languages, but that's because I've learned Arabic as a child. Um, mm-hmm. Other than that, I've been trying intensely to learn Spanish for the last three years. And my brain just, that part of my brain isn't developed properly. I, I don't recall names very well either. So it's that the same part of your brain does those two things. So, um, this mm, is where I think mm. that a lot of people are going to find challenges around. It's it's great for us to say, build a relationship with the producer. Yeah. But I want to have very functional action items for people to take away that help them approach uh-huh. um, these or just at least know the difficulties that they can encounter. So language is going to be a challenge for them if they're going to contact producers via social media or via email or whatever, WhatsApp. Um, They should just be prepared Mm -hmm. for that and have a a workaround for it. And there are workarounds. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I I use Google Translate all the time. Yeah. Uh, And it, it works well enough. And we get, our, we get our points across. You know, I talk to a couple of different producers who have not got a single lick of English um, and we just text each other or email each other or whatever. Um, and both of us are just trying desperately to make it work. Yeah. And I tend to find that going, um, say, uh, going Google Translate into either Spanish or Portuguese um, tends to work better than the other way around. Yeah. So, I've noticed yeah, the same thing. Just, <laughs> yeah. So just FYI, you're the one who's going to be doing the translation, not them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's one thing that you would change right now um, about the current situation if you had a wand? Mm, I would take COVID away so it was no longer another pressure, another pressure point. That's yeah. the one thing? <laughs> That's probably... That's that's my one thing. I would I would stop COVID or give us a vaccine or something that was available to everybody, because it's an extra pressure point that we don't need when we're trying to organise ourselves around making this a sustainable. You industry. wouldn't change. You wouldn't take the coffee price crisis. I mean, I would, but I think it's a lot more complex than that. It's a lot more complex than that. Like we can 
say all of a sudden, okay, so all coffee is going to be priced at $3 or, you know, $4 a pound if it be whatever mm-hmm. um, and take some of those pressures off. But it's not realistic to just change that because you have to change consumers, you have to change roasters, you have to change everything to make this sustainable. And it would have to be something that can flux and change with increased pressures year by year by year. Do you think people know that? Do you think people are aware of how complex all of this is? No, because people like to think it's easy, but it's not easy. This is not easy. Every single country has its own issues and its Mm. own problems, you know, um, and the way that pricing happens in each country and even each region is different. I've... I've been experiencing an increased number of people right now saying, why doesn't anybody tell people before they get into business in the coffee industry how hard it is? Yeah, it's really hard, guys. It's not easy. And it's not even a joke. <laughs> like, uh, no, Lucy's not. laughing, but that's like... It's like one of those nervous yeah, laughs. it's the kind of laughter that uh, if I had... <sighs> In normal times, I spend most of my consulting time trying to convince people not to open businesses in the coffee industry. Mm. For some weird reason, more people than ever have wanted to start their own business during COVID. Mm-hmm. I don't understand It's been it. bizarre. I don't understand it. And, you know, they're a few weeks in and they're like, uh, this looks like it's going to be really hard. Yeah. It is really hard, guys. Like, it is, there's just so many push-pull factors. It's, it's so complex. And we don't even and, have a traditional you know, model to lean back on anymore. The whole thing's not at all. broken no. and changed. This is, not, yep. this is not a time to be opening your own business if you haven't done really hard shit before in your life. Yeah, there is no playbook to this. Yeah, of the yeah. only people I'm like green lighting for new businesses if they want coaching are people who have done really hard shit and understand the the level of discomfort that they're going to have to sit in for an extended period of time navigating mm-hmm. and innovating a mess exactly. a sea of of destruction right now that that hasn't even begun to see the end of the yeah. upper tick. Exactly. Yeah, well. It's just, yeah. As we head towards wrapping up this conversation, because we've already been over like an hour and a half, which is crazy. That went very quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> would it, if we were to start making the changes that are necessary mm. to fix the COVID situation and the coffee price crisis situation, where do producers see themselves if everything goes right? I know that sounds like an obvious question, but I would really like to end this discussion on like a really great creative moment of potentiality of what we should be aiming towards. I think if everything was perfect in an ideal world producers would be on an even playing field with with consume well with roasters um not just with price but with voice in the industry not just with price but with voice what does that mean that means so they will be getting a good fair price that means that they can pay everyone who works for them a fair wage um but also that they have just as much power as we do as roasters in the industry. We look at things like um, RICO and that sort of thing, all of these uh, talks about new machinery for consuming side. Everything is about the consuming side. It's not about the producing side. All of the things that we do are about, you know, um, how do we make a better espresso? How do we do the best barista routine? We're not talking about... How do we do the best, I don't know, uh, best picking or whatever, whatever is relevant to the producers? How do we, what what is the best fertiliser? I mean, it's boring for us 
But what we're talking about in how to make the best espresso is boring for them. The conservatives not... in the audience are like, they're feeling their neck twitch right now. <laughs> Sorry, guys, but we... You want me to care? The, what? If... <laughs> If this is an industry, yeah, exactly, like, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, if this is an industry that is going to be sustainable, we all need to have a voice in it, every single one of us, and that's not not just the coolest barista of the moment or whatever. It's everybody. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that that's going to be, I hate to say this, but us having been people that have been in this industry for as long as we have, do you think that's a yeah. realistic ask? <laughs> I, I am really sad to say this, but I don't think it's actually ever going to happen. Yeah. Um, I would love to see it happen and I really think that it is important, like extremely vital for our industry um, long term. But, yeah, I mean, I know you said you wanted to leave this positive. but um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's got to be <laughs> yeah, honest just, as well, positive. Uh, yeah, but honestly I don't, I don't think that that can happen because we have too much of a superstar idea of ourselves on the consuming side. Yeah. One, I'll leave you this on a, a really positive note. One thing that I have am really grateful to COVID for because it's the proverbial fuck you to the Instagram influencer. They're no, no longer mm -hmm. relevant, e even in the coffee industry. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Now I get the feeling that your boss is trying to commandeer back his office, so I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> tell him we appreciate that he uh, gave it all up for so long. <laughs> absolutely, I will. <laughs> um, Lucy Ward, thank you so much for a really great conversation and um, – I can't wait to have this conversation again with you in hopefully about six months where we can see where things are at and touch base again. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, You're welcome. Lee. Take care, everybody. Bye.